GIP number 10, Joe Chun and his Beggars and Street Characters, I began the preceding lecture by saying that, uh, that that one and this one would form a kind of contrasting pair, that even the names of the artists sound to non-Chinese as, as though they want, one were almost the reverse of the other, Shun Zhou and Zhou Chun. And I said that the work by, Shun, by Zhou Chun that was, would occupy us in this lecture might be termed not gazing into the past, but gazing out of my window. And I hope that that excited your curiosity and brought you back to find out what I could possibly have meant by that. So, first images, please. Here to introduce Zhou Chun is a typical work, the large hanging scroll in the Palace Museum in Beijing. It's immediately obvious that it's not a painting that Shun Zhou could have painted or would have wanted to. It's technically beyond Shun Zhou's capacity as an amateur, and it's in the thoroughly professional manner that he and his gentry literati class mostly profess to look down upon. Zhou Chun was indeed a straightforward professional master, making his living by painting, doing works on commission, and all the rest. The style that he follows here isn't that of some Yuan period master, but a Song tradition, that of Li Tang and his followers. And the scene he depicts is one that's familiar to us from many pictures by those artists. The inn where the travelers can stop, rest, eat, and drink, feed their livestock. Notice the two donkeys at a trough inside the open building. Another traveler arriving over a bridge with his servants. And the road that the traveler will take the next morning, continuing at a depth, built out from the cliff. All this is depicted in a polished manner, no free movements of the brush, no expressive plays. Next. I will leave on while I relate a few basic things about Zhou Chun, this hand scroll titled The North Sea, which is on the cover of my Parting at the Shore book, the one on uh, early and middle Ming painting. Uh, the scroll is in the Nelson Gallery, Kansas City. I don't have a complete set of slides easily accessible, and I'll show only two large sections in a detail. Zhou Chun was active in Suzhou in the late 15th and early 16th century. His last dated works are around 1640. He has, I think, been underrated in Chinese writings, overshadowed by his two more famous pupils, Tang Yin and Chu Ying. One critic, writing shortly after his death, comments about Zhou Chun slightingly that, quote, he was praised by everybody in his time as an artisan painter, that is, for his technique. The feelings of loneliness and solitude, the flavor of remoteness and reserve, were not within his reach, end quote. As you may recall, this seems to echo the put-downs that were written by late Northern Sung literati critics of the major landscapists of that time, who could in fact paint rings around them, loneliness and all. Uh, we're learning, I think, to dismiss all that as self-serving rhetoric. Next, please. The painting depicts a man seated in the open study of his house, looking out into the storm over the water. A visitor is seen arriving with his servant in the lower left. My use of a painting with someone arriving as cover for a book titled Parting at the Shore aroused some comment, but I won't go on about that. As I write about this painting in my book, quote, the painting is composed and executed as faultlessly as any that Ming painting can offer. There is nothing in it that seems arbitrary or calligraphically assertive or the outcome of momentary whim. Spontaneity is irrelevant to its character, end quote. The drama created in it, the visual excitement, are not inconsiderable achievements, I think. Larry Sickman had the good sense to buy works by underappreciated artists, uh, works that were available for lower prices. Next, please. Sickman also bought for his museum this horizontal Zhou Chun painting, which came from a Japanese collection and had been published there. It's titled The Clear Pool, literally the White Pool, and it depicts the, the pool in the mountains surrounded by rocks and trees. Next, please. A lofty scholar, Gaucher, sits on the bank holding a fly whisk, enjoying the sights and sounds of the wind in the trees, the lapping of the water. He sits upright on a tiger skin mat books beside him. His boy servant fans a stove that will heat water for tea. Next. Like the scholar in Ma Lin's Listening to the Wind in the Pines, he seems almost to strike a pose, expressing his responsiveness to his surroundings. In this, too, the painting echoes faithfully Southern Sung Academy painting. 
Next. The setting is equally faithful to its sources. Rocks, structured and textured like those in works by Li Tong followers. Pine trees growing naturally with bunches of needles, all depicted with care. Next. The issue of originality, so important to artists of our own period, and anticipated in the Chinese literati, has no place here. The painter is not exhibiting his precious temperament, but producing a good picture. If we find that achievement difficult to appreciate today, it's our fault, not the artist's. Next. Notice how simply but sensitively and truthfully Zhou Chun indicates the swirls of water at the base of the rocks. An artist who commissioned a picture from an artist like Zhou Chun expect, expected that level of technical achievement, just as Zhou Wei Da, in effect commissioning an album from Chun Zhou in the previous lecture, expected sensitive evocations of the great Yuan masters, as well as bits of quirky inventiveness. Next. The artist writes the three-character title and signs it using his Hao, Dongchun, or Eastern Village, and he impresses a seal below. Zhou Chan seldom writes more than that. Uh, the work that we'll concentrate on later is an exception. Next. Similar in style and subject is this fan painting by Zhou Chan in the National Palace Museum, Taipei, in which the lofty scholar stands listening to the wind of the pines, his robes blown by the wind while his servant arrives across a bridge at right carrying a chin zither, which he will play to blend its soft sounds with the natural sounds around him. Cho Chan painted a great many fans of this kind. It was part of the production of any typical Ming artist. I use this one in trying to establish Cho Chan's authorship of another painting. Next, please. A hand scroll in the Freer Gallery, titled Dreaming of Immortality in a Thatched Cottage on which is written at left a false inscription purporting to be by Tang Yin. The painting is really, I'm convinced, by Zhou Chun, and it's an example of something that we read about in books, that is, how his paintings were doctored to be sold as works by his more famous disciple. As the scroll opens, a man is seen sleeping at his desk through the open window of his house among pine trees, and as one rolls on, the man is seen again in his dream, floating out in space as an immortal. I won't talk more about this wonderful work in detail because I have no details, but it's another that shows the remarkable range and inventiveness of Zhou Chun. In this one, a hanging scroll in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, the scholar gentleman has come out from his house to watch three boys, presumably his sons, catching the seed pods as they fall from the willow tree. Notice the foreshortening of the upturned faces. Versatility in subjects as well as style was expected of artists like Zhou Chun. We can remember from my lecture on four pictorial hand scrolls in an album how the later professional artist Gu Jianlong kept albums of funban copies of details of old paintings that he saw for use in his own works. Zhou Chun must have done the same. Next, please. Still another large hanging scroll in the National Palace Museum, Taipei, where most of the hanging scrolls from the old imperial collection ended up. This one gives us another ideal scene of the scholar gentleman's life. In this one, he sits in his lakeside pavilion, which probably projects out from his house, gazing out meditatively and listening to the blending of natural and man-made sounds, the wind blowing over the rippling water and through the trees, its sound harmonizing with the sound of the flute played by the fisherman, or the scholar fisherman, in the foreground boat, his open wine pot and its ladle beside him. Next. The man in the waterside porch has been reading a book, which lies open behind him. His face expresses his inward state, absorbing sensations from all around him, while remaining self-absorbed. As I remarked in my lecture on Ma Yuan, and elaborated in the first chapter of my Lyric Journey book, the scholar gentlemen themselves never depicted scenes of this kind, even insofar as they were capable of them. It's left for the academicians and professionals masters of conveying moods of this kind, to portray people experiencing these lofty feelings, which in principle, they could not experience themselves. This is an anomaly behind a lot of Chinese painting. Next, please. In some of his works, Zhou Chun draws in a looser, running line manner, akin to Xing Shu, the more cursive manner of writing and calligraphy. In this, he follows the practice of some others of the better professional masters of the, of the Ming, including Wu Wei and Tang Yin. As I write in my book, 
It has the effect of turning mass into movement. A slight or partial move in that direction can be seen in this horizontal painting in the Taipei Palace Museum, painted in 1639 and centered on a man seen in the open room of his thatched cottage playing Wei Chi with a guest while a servant serves them tea. Next. Through a window at left, another servant is seen working in the kitchen. The texture strokes on the slope are not in the Li Tong manner this time, but in faster, linear brush drawing, which, along with the rest of the drawing, serves to carry the viewer's eye more swiftly over the surface. Next. Seen up close, the run-down state of the house is entertainingly depicted. Some of the plaster covering the outer wall has fallen away, revealing the piled-up tiles beneath. The vertical supports are unfinished logs, and rags and pots hang untidily above them. Zhou Chun shows himself to be adept at a kind of quick anecdotal drawing. We'll see him using it brilliantly in his pictures of beggars and street characters. Next. Beyond at the right, another man, bent with age and holding a staff, crosses the simple bridge. More figures are seen uh, in houses further back. Here again, the effect of wind is shown in the ruffled surface of the water, which softens and fades into distance. Next. The fast-running linear manner and its effect of adding visual stimulation to the picture are seen more strongly exemplified in this hand scroll in the Taipei Palace Museum titled Enjoying the Dusk. The title is written by the artist in this inscription, not included in this image. It's a further move into what I term in writing about it in my book, the scribbly manner, a term I don't mean pejoratively. The old scholar gentleman has come out of his house in the evening to sit enjoying the cooling wind and gaze into the band of fog. I write about it in my book as, quote, an entertaining performance in which the landscape materials are reduced almost to pure linearity. Since the nature of the drawing works against the convincing rendition of space as well as mass, Zhou Chun introduces an archaically hard-edged passage of fog between near and far grounds to compensate for the lack of depth, end quote. And I continue, interestingly, I think, I couldn't write this way today, quote, in the strong, flat design produced by the heavy delineation and simplification of form, the painting resembles late works of Shunzhou and probably reflects his influence. Shun, whether or not he was still alive when this was painted, was no doubt still the most prestigious figure in Suzhou painting circles, end quote. I had sorted out early and middle Ming painting in my head when I wrote this book to the degree that I could discern large social and chronological patterns that would escape me now, just as they escaped or proved difficult to be accepted by my colleagues at that time. Next. I was able to recognize also subtle relationships between artists working in different regional schools. For instance, in writing about this painting titled Poetic Thoughts Beneath Pine, Pines by a Stream, painted by Zhou Chun in 1534 and kept again in the Taipei Palace Museum. In his longer-than-usual inscription on it, Zhou Chun also makes the unusual claim that he's imitating the brush manner or the style of Dai Jin. It was unusual for an artist in one local school to be imitating the style of a master in another local school. Dai Jin, who had worked about a century earlier in nearby Zhejiang province, after which the school he founded came to be called the Just School. Next, please. Here is a painting by Dai Jin in the Shanghai Museum, which I've shown already in previous lectures, with an inscription by the powerful late Ming critic and artist Dong Shi Chang, beginning, quote, The professional artist, that is Hua Shi, a condescending term for them, the professional artist or Hua Shi of our dynasty all take Dai Wen Jin to be a great master, end quote. He goes on, but that's as much as I want to quote. He implies, as I noted before, that he and his fellow literati, connoisseurs, uh, know better. But that comment, of course, agrees with Zhou Chun, a Suzhou or Wu school artist, doing a painting in the style of Dai Jin. Next, please. This well-known painting by Dai Jin, titled Returning Late from a Spring Outing and in the Taipei Palace Museum, is a better comparison with Zhou Chun's picture for style, the same mode of composing out of large flat forms of equal weight, the same use of tall trees, of foreground versus further hilltop, and so forth. Next. 
a detail of Drotron's picture in which the two gentlemen are seen sitting and talking on a bank beneath the pines, while a servant in a cave below at right prepares things for them to eat and drink. Looking at Joe's painting for itself is more important than establishing its coordinates of style. Writing about this painting by Joe Chun in my Parting at the Shore book, I discussed the ways in which it is more true to its Southern Sung prototypes, paintings by Mao Ran and others, than any by Dai Jin could have been. But then I went on to point out how it also differs from any Southern Song landscape, or a landscape with figures work, writing this, quote, The empty area, however, which in a Southern Song picture would read as deep space, is here irredeemably blank paper. The clues with which the painter surrounds it are not the right ones to project us imaginatively at a depth. This is, in the end, essentially a Ming painting, end quote. I remember some reviewer quoting that observation with approval as an example of how effectively I could do such style analysis and write about style in paintings. My colleagues who wrote reviews of my books were likely to praise my treatments of style in this way, while then going on to say, why, when he does this so well, can't he be satisfied with just doing this? Why does he have to go on and give us those wrong-headed arguments of his? Haha, <laughs> next. Finally, before we turn to the work by Zhou Chun that is the main subject of this lecture, and another hang, still another hanging scroll by him in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, this one painted in ink on paper, in a style that is unusual for him, far from the Li Tong-like, Song-derived style with which we began. And I'm not attempting, by the way, to do these chronologically. This isn't necessarily later than the others. Here he seems to be moving even more into the terrain of the scholar amateurs, combining the running line manner with heavy dotting, both for trees and as an all-over application that gives a surface resonance, more like what a scholar amateur might do. The mountain forms also, and their build-up from bottom to top, seem to be derived more from some compositionally strong scholar amateur, such as Huang Gunguang, than from Li Tong and the Academy Masters next. Zhou Chun's signature is the usual simple one, giving no clue to why he is painting in this unusual style. But a long poetic inscription in the upper right, written by somebody else, suggests that the painting was done for some cultivated literatus, for whom Zhou Chun probably adapted his style, as he was quite capable of doing whenever he chose to, into one that he thought the recipient would especially enjoy. Sometimes a group of friends would commission a work from an artist for presentation to someone on his birthday or another occasion. This may be such a work. And that ends the first part of this lecture, a general presentation of Zhou Chun's Landscapes with Figures, the works for which he is best known. Now we come to his most unusual work, his most unconventional, rule-breaking, and brilliantly original work, his album of beggars and street characters. Next, please. The work was originally painted on large album leaves, folded down the middle in the usual way, one figure on each side, 12 of these for a total of 24 figures. We know from copies that several more figures were originally part of the series, but are no longer part of it. The artist's inscription follows the last leaf. They are painted in ink and colors on paper, each leaf about 40 centimeters in height. The work is now divided into two parts, one owned by the Honolulu Academy of Arts, the other by the Cleveland Art Museum. Next, please. The separation of the album, or the hand scroll, into two parts is, as the knowledgeable among you might expect, the work of the eccentric dealer Walter Hochstetter, seen here in a photo made during the period when I knew him best, that is the 1960s, 70s, 80s. He died some years ago, and I received this photo from one of his sons now living in Australia. He was well known for doctoring paintings, removing or repainting places they didn't like in them, and for dividing the work, especially an album or a hand scroll, and selling parts of it to different buyers. Uh, he typically took out the leaves or the section he liked best and sold it to a favored customer, then sold the remainder to the one he favored less. A uh, very nice collector named Richard Hobart in Cambridge who deserved better, was the recipient of many of these leftover parts. Uh, in the case of the Zhou Chun, Chun album uh, or scroll, the Honolulu Art Academy got the leaves Hochstetter liked best, while the remainder went 
by way of another dealer, Nat Hammer, to the Cleveland Art Museum. Next, please. But still another delay before we begin looking seriously at Joe Chun's beggars. I want to put them in contact quickly with a few other Chinese painters of beggars from earlier and later times. Let me say immediately and stress that none of these is really like Zhou Chun's work, which is, to my knowledge, unique in Chinese painting. And I begin with one of the late 12th century 500 Arhat series of paintings, mostly in the Daitokuji in Kyoto, but a few of them in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in the Freer Gallery. This is one of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts paintings, which they have titled Arhats Bestowing Alms on Beggars. In the upper part are five Arhats, as there are in each of the series, four of them watching the fifth, who is dropping coins down to some beggars who occupy the lower part, the realm of earth. They are miserable figures dressed in rags, several of them scrabbling about on the ground for the coins while the others watch. This is a decidedly non-politically correct view of the poor, devoid of any real sympathy. In the Buddhist system, one rose or fell in status as he was reborn from one life to the next, according to the good and bad deeds one committed in each life. So beggars, they could believe, somehow deserved their miserable status because of deeds they had committed in previous lives. Next, please. Some other low-class types are depicted in Sung painting with more sympathy or humor, notably the knick-knack peddler who brings packs of attractive gugos around to village people for them to buy, as we see in this painting by Lee Sung and others. Next. As I noted when talking about these, it's possible that they carried a political significance, the peddler representing the emperor who brings blessings to the common people. The subject continues to be popular in the Ming Dynasty and is painted by artists of the academic kind, such as Lu Wanying, to whom both these entertaining pictures are attributed. Next. Many paintings of street entertainers and musicians exist. This is one by the mid-18th century Yangzhou artist Zai Jia, which I bought for our University Art Museum as an especially sensitive portrayal of three of them, led by a little boy. Quite a few hand scrolls of this kind of subject survive, but I don't have images of them easily available, and I don't want to take time to speak about them at length. Next. Here briefly are a few images from an album that I used to own myself by another 18th century painter, Huang Shun, originally from Fujian, later working in Yangzhou. This album, which is dated to 1730, may be from his period in Fujian, when he was a disciple of Shang Guangzhou. Although a few of the beggars seen here are shown as blind or crippled, the views of them that the artist presents are generally anecdotal, entertaining, charmingly low class, not confronting the viewer with any of the truly harsh realities of the lives of these homeless people. And the same is true generally of Chinese paintings, they mostly don't convey any of the unpleasant aspects of their subjects. Why, the artist must have felt, when our patrons don't want to be disturbed by unpleasant images, why should we risk our good standing among them by painting such things? A thoroughly sensible attitude, we must admit, and completely in keeping with the theory and practice of Chinese painting as a whole, and with much of our own for that matter. Patronage calls the shots. Artists paint what they think their customers will want to acquire even when it's camouflaged within an ostensible freedom from all such motivation. Next, please. And now at last to Zhou Chun's work. The scroll in Cleveland begins with this title, which I put on not to identify the writer, I have no idea who he is, but to comment on the title that he gives to the series. Zhou Chun Liu Min Tu. Uh, this is not Zhou Chun's title. He doesn't give us one, but the choice of it by whoever it is the choice of this title is significant. Liu Min means something like displaced people or destitute people, and it refers back to a famous painting of that title, known only from an historical record. It was painted in 1074, late northern Shung, on the order of a certain Zheng Xia, a government official, and it portrayed suffering people in a certain district of the capital, Kaifeng. Zheng Xia meant it to criticize the policies of the prime minister of that time, Wang Anshu, which he believed had brought on uh, the d destitution and misery of these people. You can find an account of all this on page 23 of my Three Alternative Histories book. In applying the same term, Liu Mintu, to Zhou Chun's work, the writer of this title suggests a similar motivation for it. 
Is there any justification for that idea? Might Joe Trump have been making a political statement? Uh, after saying that, I should remind you, as I tend to these days, that the party of Wang Lanshur that Zheng Xiao is criticizing represented the progressive force, the reformers, while Zheng Xiao, like the famous literati artists and calligraphers of that time, Su Dong Po and the rest of them, were the entrenched conservatives, fulminating against any attempts to carry out programs that would benefit the common people. So when you side with the literati in China, be aware that you're siding with the Newt Gingriches and the John Boners of their time, not the enlightened Barack Obamas or whoever you choose to support. Now, on, on to the painting. In fact, there is good reason to believe that Zhou Chun was making a political statement. His own inscription, written originally as an added double leaf in his album, now mounted at the end of the Cleveland Scroll, begins with the date which corresponds to 1516. China was just then emerging from a very bad period in which a corrupt eunuch named Liu Jin and his clique had usurped power from a boy emperor and had drained the empire of much of its wealth, causing widespread poverty and misery, what we call gross economic inequality. The writer of one of the three colophones or inscriptions attached to the series suggests that Zhou Chun's depiction of destitute people was intended to criticize this eunuch, and he may well be right. But Zhou Chun's inscription makes no such claim. It reads, as translated by Wai Gam Ho, quote, In the autumn of the Bingzi year of the Zhengde era, that's 1516, in the seventh month, I was idling under the window, and suddenly there came to my mind all the appearances and manners of the beggars and other street characters whom I often saw on the streets and markets. With brush and ink ready at hand, I put them into pictures in an impromptu way. It may not be worthy of serious enjoyment, but it certainly can be considered as a warning and admonition to the world." End quote. I'll talk about the implications of that inscription as I talk also about the colophones and the speculations of their writers about what Zhou Chan really intended. But let me make one simple comment. In saying that this work could be called not gazing into the past, but gazing out of my window, I was cheating a bit. Zhou Chan isn't giving us what he saw from his window. That was only where he was idling when he, when all these images came into his head, as he writes. He's setting down what he saw in the marketplace, uh, presumably over a long period of time. We have no idea whether he made sketches as he moved about Suzhou, sketches he could later use in these paintings. It's quite possible or even likely that he did. Next, please. An anonymous hand scroll that I showed in a previous lecture depicting scenes of a village includes this street scene with performers, much like some of those depicted by Zhou Chun, except that these belong to the common type that portrays them as people comfortable in their roles, not as suffering. Now, in understanding how Zhou Chun's work was understood by people of his time or shortly afterwards, the three colophones attached to the series, now at the end of the Cleveland portion, are important, and I myself translated them and discussed them for the first time in my Parting at the Shore book. But without straining my imagination much, I can hear cries of, no Chinese text please, show us the pictures at last, after all this talk about them. So I'll do just that, showing each double leaf first, then the individual figures and details from them, as I also read and talk about the three colophones. I hope this will not be too confusing. Next please. The order in which the paintings are mounted now in the two scrolls may not be the original order, but there is no way to determine that. The Honolulu scroll opens with this pair, originally facing each other on the double leaf spread of the album. Zhou Chan has certainly planned these as pairs, and they work that way, as we'll see. And please understand that I have no real expertise in identifying Ming period street people in Suzhou. Ha <laughs> ha, identifying those on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley is hard enough so that much of what I'll say about them is speculation, based on simple, ill-informed observation. In this first double leaf, a prognosticator, carrying his yarrow stalks in a bamboo tube container from which to throw them, confronts a mendicant monk in a tattered robe, holding a begging bowl and raising his hand to ask for alms. Next, the fortune teller appears to be an educated man and fairly well off, perhaps a would-be scholar official who failed to pass the exams 
with a high enough score to gain official status and who turned to this way of earning his living. Next. The monk also appears relatively comfortable in his poverty. The ragged bottom of his robe hangs over neat white undergarments seen below. His expression is mildly benevolent. His nearly bald head is well shaved, and his complexion shows no effects of damaging exposure. He has been living a relatively secure life in one of the Sujo temples, and has come out to solicit alms. Next, please. Further down in the economic and social order are these two, a snake peddler and an emaciated man who walks with a long bamboo pole. Now we move into the more grotesque images and more challenging, which reveal or seem to reveal a sharp observation and depiction that does not prettify or sentimentalize the subjects at all. Here we arrive at what makes Zhou Chun's series so special, virtually unique in Chinese painting. Next. The snake peddler, in spite of his ragged shirt and pants, seems relatively healthy. His coloring is even, and his feet are firmly planted on the ground. Zhou Chun's anatomical drawing, which I will not comment on throughout, is difficult to match in pre-modern Chinese painting. The next. The serpent seen writhing and sticking their heads up in his basket must be meant for eating or for medicinal purposes. Someone else could write a learned essay on the uses of snakes in Chinese medicine. The first of the three colophones, which as I say, I was the first to translate and publish in translation, was written in 1564 by a certain Huang Jishui, who begins by noting that Zhou Chun was especially famous for his figure painting, and he continues, quote, um, This album depicts the appearances of all the different kinds of beggars whom Zhou Chun observed in the streets of the city, capturing perfectly the special aspect of each. Looking at the pictures, one can't help sighing deeply. Nowadays, people come round on dark nights, covertly begging and wailing in their desire for riches and high position. If only we could bring back Mr. Zhou to portray them. The summoned scholar Wu Yun brought out this album to show me, and I wrote this impromptu inscription at the end. Uh, end quote. And I go on saying, Huang's point is that there are beggars in high places as well as low, in the yamans as well as in the streets. Summoned scholar was a term of respect for one who had been given a post at court. Wu Yun, literally meaning lying in the clouds, is a studio name, probably that of an official named Zheng Guobin. Okay, enough for that colophone. The other figure of this pair, I can't identify exactly what he's selling or pursuing, that is. He has a bag slung along his hip containing I don't know what. He may be simply a beggar out to solicit money from more prosperous people on the street, impressing them or even alarming them with his gaunt appearance, his twisted face and his row of crooked teeth in what appears more like an animal's mouth than a human's. Here again we should note the anatomical conviction of Zhou Chun's drawing, the strong sense of muscle and bone structure beneath the skin. What other anatomical drawing had he done over the years to become capable of this? Nothing, to my knowledge, gives us any clue of how to answer that question. Next, please. The second colophone is by the more famous Zhang, Fe Zhang Feng Yi, who passed the exams for official service in 1564. Uh, he makes the case for Zhou Chun's paintings carrying the political messages that I mentioned earlier, uh, making the parallel with the Northern Sung painting commissioned by Zhang Xia. His colophone can be translated this way, quote, This album presents us with the many aspects of misery, hunger and cold, homeless destitution, infirmity and emaciations, deformity and sickness. Anyone who can look at this and not be wounded to the heart by compassion is not a humane person. The Bingzi year of the Zhengde era, that is 1516 when the album was painted, was only a few years after the seditious Liu Jin spread his poison. This was the height of Jiang Bin's and Wang Ning's exercising of their brutality. I imagine also that the officials and nobles were seldom able to nurture and succor the common people. Thus, this work by Zhou Chun has the same intent as Zheng Xiao's destitute people. It was meant as an aid to government and is not a shallow thing. 
one can't dismiss it as a play with ink. The next painting in the series depicts a homeless person at right who has pulled a root vegetable, some kind of radish, from someone's garden, perhaps, or stolen it at a market, and is eating it. He is one of the relatively healthy-looking street people, with a pot of some kind hung at his hip. I don't seem to have made any details of this figure. Next. The other is one of the most powerful and affecting in the whole series, and is the one I chose to reproduce in color, more or less full-size, in my Ming book. He is a skeletal firewood carrier, carrying a load of fine stalks or sticks of wood for use in starting fires. He carries a broken bowl, perhaps his only possession in one hand. His emaciation is extreme, to the point that the, he appears almost like a demon, scarcely human. Zhou Chun understands and conveys the dehumanizing effect of extreme deprivation. Uh, now the third colophon is by Wen Jiao, finally a colophon by Wen Jiao, the son of Wen Zhengming. This colophon is dated 1577, and it reads, quote, This painting by Zhou Chun depicts the appearances of hungry and chilly beggars in order to warn the world. Huang Jishui takes it to represent those who, quote, come around on a dark night seeking alms, while Zhang Feng Yi compares it to Zheng Xiao's picture of the Anchang Gate. These views of the two gentlemen both have their points. In the old days, Tang Yin, whenever he saw a painting by Zhou, would kowtow deeply before it and cry, Master Zhou! So much was he aware of not being able to equal Zhou's divine wonders. This album could not, I believe, have been done by anyone else. I am in complete agreement with Tang Yin's heartfelt obeisance. Such a piece is not to be acquired easily. The qualities that Huang and Zhang point to must be considered beyond the forms of the painting. They are not to be found in formal likeness or in brush and ink." End quote. Uh, one Jia, himself a painter and famous as a connoisseur, seems less concerned than the other two with understanding how such a series of pictures came to be painted. He simply accepts the views of the other two colophonists and goes on to praise the painting as a work of art, ending by saying that the issues raised by the other two are, quote, not to be found in formal likeness or in brush and ink, end quote, which is like saying that he doesn't want to consider them at all. And that has been the fate of Zhou Chun's work in later times down to the present. It has come down to us, unrecorded and seemingly unnoticed, to be acquired at last by a former for foreign dealer and sold to foreign museums. Next. A double leaf depicting two women whom one might see in the street, one middle-aged, the other younger and prettier, both carrying sacks of something over their shoulders. Suzhou citizens would have known who they were, where they came from, what was in their sacks. I don't. This is one of the double leaves relatively mild in expression, not meant to shock the world or to disturb the viewer. It's part of Zhou Chun's purpose to keep a balance in what he depicts and not exaggerate the shocking sights to be seen in the Suzhou marketplace, but to, so to speak, turn the level of shock or bitterness up and down from leaf to leaf. Next. These two, made up with black and white on their faces, one carrying a flag, the other waving a rag, must be street performers of some kind, who enacted some kind of ritual drama, perhaps, in the street. My UC Berkeley colleague and friend, David Johnson, one of whose specialties is the village religious drama, could perhaps tell us who they are and what they were doing. But if I started bringing in specialists, I would soon render myself superfluous. Next. This one has smeared some black substance over his face, leaving his eyes, nose, and mouth uncovered. Cho Chun gives to the faces of some of the street people more of intense expressiveness than we are accustomed to seeing in Chinese paintings of people which normally avoid all that is momentary and transient, concentrating instead on moments of repose. So much of what I am saying about the series of images can be summed up as Zhou Chun is doing all the wrong things for a professional artist of his time and place. Next. A detail of the figure's costume showing that ideal combination of the trenchantly descriptive and the powerfully expressive that Chinese brushwork can exhibit when it comes from the hand of an artist of high technical training, 
who ventures to break the rules of his profession. Next. The other, white-faced figure, waving a yellow rag with what appears to be a bottle sung on his hip and a reddish skirt over white, tattered pants. His grimace and his waving of the rag must be parts of his act, whatever it is. Next. The last double leaf on the Honolulu scroll pairs what I would take to be another exorcist with a demon street sweeper. Jochun has paired the figures in his double leaves in various ways, likeness and contrast, or as here, one holding his paddle up, the other his broom downward, one walking, one standing, and so forth. I haven't attempted compositional analyses, but they could be done with interesting results. Next. The reason I speculate that this, that this figure is some kind of exorcist is that the image on his paddle appears to be that of Junque, the mythical demon queller, and the figure's face, with upturned eyes, has the set look of someone committed to his mission, or conveying that impression. I have no idea what would be in his basket. Next. The street sweeper is another study in powerful, if undernourished, anatomy, with bones and muscles exposed to the skin. Zhou Chun convinces us throughout that he is really conveying what he has seen, that if we could be magically transported back to the Sujo marketplace of his time, we would see people disturbingly like these. Next. The street sweeper's head, with wild hair and wilder eyes, some hair grown so long that it hangs down over his chest, his mouth open in a demonic grin, all his teeth showing the upper ones accurately enough that we can distinguish a molar at one end from the incisors in the center. Are there more powerful and disturbing images in world art of what poverty and degradation do to the human being? Next. From the Cleveland Scroll, I don't have really good slides made by myself, so I'll move over it more quickly. The images are no less sharply observed and trenchantly portrayed than those from the Honolulu Scroll and they merit full treatment at another time by someone else. It remains only to recount the later reception of Zhou Chun's groundbreaking and rule-breaking work. The images were striking and interesting enough that several copies were made, but what of the famous connoisseurs, the great collectors of late Ming and Qing? How did they respond to it? Answer, by ignoring it completely. It bears no seals of later collectors and is recorded, so far as I know, in no collector's catalog. Next. In earlier lectures I showed several times and discussed at length this painting in the Shanghai Museum ascribed to the 10th century master Xu Shi. I've used it many times to represent a Chinese painting that has in effect no style, no visible traces of the brush, no references to the past, nothing beyond an amazingly truthful portrayal of the physical properties of its subject. Was its achievement recognized by the great reputation makers of China? Again, no. It's another that has come down absolutely barren of collector seals, absolutely unmentioned in catalogs and other writings, so far as I know. So we learn from these two, and no doubt from many others that haven't survived or that I don't know about, what the consequences were of not following the guidelines laid down by the all-powerful critics and theoreticians of China. You were sidelined, ignored, kept out of the mainstream. Do you wonder, seeing these two and others, that I have devoted so much of my career from the beginning to these to those artists who are outside the official canon? My first public paper, presented at the great uh, 1970 groundbreaking symposium, uh, the International Symposium at the Palace Museum in Taipei, was about the late Ming artist Wu Bin. Next, please. Here is a painting by him while I talk. And Chinese commentators in the audience expressed wonderment that this artist, whom none of them had noticed, had received such attention from a foreign scholar. To quote one of them, quote, If Wu Bin were alive now, he would be extraordinarily grateful to Mr. Cahill, for Wu Bin has been forgotten in China for several hundred years, and has probably never received such praise as this. Now we have the moving spectacle of his having found an admirer on the other side of the Pacific Ocean." End quote. Next, back to Zhou Chun's images of beggars and street characters. This series has also found a great many admirers on this other side of the Pacific Ocean, beginning with Walter Hochstetter, 
who must have bought it in China, uh, Gustav Ecke and Sherman Lee, who bought it for their museums in Honolulu and Cleveland, and all those who have studied it and written about it, including myself back in the 1970s. But also for another, Henry Kleinhens, who wrote most of the entry for it in the Eight Dynasties catalog, and who, after quoting my translations of the three colophones, written shortly after the album was painted, ends with this paragraph, quote, The role of trenchant social critic, which these contemporary critics cast for the artist Joe Chun, is certainly at odds with his other surviving works, beggars and street characters being unique. Perhaps more such works were painted, but have failed to survive. Cahill, and he cites my Parting at the Shore book, Cahill speculates that these uncomfortable subjects would hardly appeal to most patrons in traditional China, who preferred and thus preserved those things they found beautiful and pleasing to themselves. Such prejudice might explain why this painting bears no seals of famous connoisseurs or collectors. Moreover, as a professional artist, Zhou Chun could hardly have expected to make his living by producing documents of social impact. Beggars and street characters could therefore be considered the private, personal expression of a painter with a social conscience. End quote. That's good. Good for Henry Kleinhens. Now, I'll end with two images from the Cleveland Scroll. This beggar holding what looks like a rock, but must, I assume, be a piece of bread or something else edible. Another figure presented to us in a hauntingly real, powerfully human image, exhibiting far more understanding of how humans, even the lowest, are constructed out of bone and muscle and flesh and skin than we're accustomed to seeing in Chinese painting. Next, and a far more vivid revelation of how inner life and passion continue to inspire these people, even in their degradation, and communicate itself across the centuries and the ocean to us through the mysterious power of art that transcends boundaries of time and place and conventions. Next, and last, I conclude with this image from the Cleveland Scroll, a nearly blind old woman, led by her goat, darkened by age and exposure and disease, one leg badly swollen, leaning on her staff as she makes her difficult way through the streets of Sutro. And a baby, its tiny face turned inward, its hands reaching upward. A baby suckles at her withered breast. What can it find there to sustain it? And what future can it have in a society and a world that makes such creatures out of people who were born guiltless and deserving? Today is the day after Christmas 2011, and I finish writing this to go off and begin going through my piles of brochures and appeals to fill out forms and write checks for all the organizations and charitable institutions that I support. And if memories of Joe Chun's beggars and street characters remain in my mind and merge with the images in all those brochures of poor and suffering and needy people all over the world whom they are trying to help and whom they can help more if I contribute more, if this makes me write my checks for somewhat larger amounts than I otherwise would have, we will have one more example of the power of art to improve people and their actions, however slightly and however fleetingly. And for that, finally, you'll have to take my word, since you can't see my checkbook. But believe me, it's the truth. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year 2012 to you all from James Cahill.